Rate ratios, those are the focus of this video. So how do we calculate a rate ratio? And I think this video will make it pretty easy, but if you have any questions, there's the online field epidemiology manual that you have from the CDC that also has a few examples, but I think that this example should do the trick for you. So what is the rate ratio? Well, it is the rate of disease among the exposed over the rate of disease among the unexposed. And again, you can sub out that term exposed for the rate of disease among those with one risk factor versus the rate of disease among the people that don't have that risk factor. So in this case, we're going to focus on the older Pokemon or the more mature Pokemon versus the ones that are not so mature. So this is going to be our exposed population. This is our unexposed population. So in order to do the incidence of the exposed over the first time of the exposed, we have to know what the incidence value is among the exposed. And we also have to know the person time on the exposed and do the same for the unexposed. So first of all, what is the incidence of disease among the exposed? There's one, two, three, four, five cases. And then what's the incidence of coronavirus among the unexposed? There is one case. So that's a five and that's a one. Now, in order to get the person time, we have to add up all the person time that each individual participant contributes. So how much does this one contribute? So if you can follow the numbers there, is our little Charizard or Charmander, whatever that, I guess that's Charmander down there, contributes 14. And next, there's 11. And then the Toro or the Taurus, 12. And then next, this guy, no infection, healthy, all 15 days, count. Moving on, 11. And then a few more healthier ones, 15, 15, and 15. So what about this sly guy here? How much time is contributed? Well, we had 11 days until got away. We had lost the follow-up here. So we've lost the follow-up. So 11 days. And then this big crabby guy, 11 days. So this represents all of the person time among the exposed. And then among the unexposed, this little Jigglypuff thing, 12 days, Charmander, 15 days, this little Eevee thing, 11 days. And then we've got this little baby Pokemon here, good old Pikachu, there's 15 days. So this is our incidence of disease among the exposed, one, two, three, four, five, over all that person time. So that's five out of 130 over one case out of 53. So if you added all those numbers up, that's 130. If you add all these numbers up, that's 53. So when you do the math for a lot of these rate ratios, especially if the disease gets even more rare, out of all the person time that's accumulated you could sometimes get really small numbers but when you divide those small numbers they make more sense so the rate of disease among the exposed is 0 0.038 cases per day and the rate of disease among this group or the incidence density rate among this group is 0 0.019 so when you compare the rate of disease among the exposed and the unexposed, you get a rate ratio of 2.0. Some people will refer to it as the incidence rate ratio, which is just fine. Um, but uh, incidence of disease is what we're looking at. You can do these for other things like whether or not they have an antibody response or whether or not they die or whether or not they have a heart attack or whether or not they get diagnosed with diabetes. There's all kinds of ways you could use these types of studies. So pretty easy in general for a review. The two primary types of cohort studies, we're looking at prospective 
and retrospective, but again, you can also have ambispective ones as well. Can you derive a case control study out of a cohort study? So could you derive a case control study out of all of a big cohort study? And the answer is yes. We call those nested case controls. And then what are the three most common measures of risk from a cohort study or from cohort studies? So if you were right now to go to Google Scholar and look up some of the cohort studies on the coronavirus, which you guys know how to do now, if you were to do that, you would see actually a lot of odds ratio calculations for cohort studies just because logistic regression and odds ratio calculations are so easy. And if the disease is rare and you were to like do these studies over and over again with huge, huge data sets, you would find that when we have rare diseases, that incidence rate ratio and the risk, well, the risk ratio at least, not the rate ratio, the risk ratio and the odds ratio are almost the same when a disease is rare. It's just how the math works. The odds and the risk approach one another when the disease is really, really rare. So, cohort studies can measure risk using risk rate and odds ratios. If you do a case control study or a cross-sectional study, it's not appropriate to do anything else other than the odds ratio um, risk is not appropriate because you don't know the true risk because you didn't give everyone an equal chance of getting the disease. You, you surveyed in a different way. So again, we have all these options. There are some formula options. Uh, moving in, or I guess, you know, while we're in this video, I'll just go ahead and wrap up the cohort study section here. It's important for us to think about some things like who are we going to study? So ideally in a prospective design, you would have some reason for why you're doing the study. You have to have a kind of a reason and you're going to want to probably have in advance a healthy population of people that you presume are going to be exposed to something. So you could have a healthy population of bus drivers and then see, you know, what is it about the health of bus drivers that may change over the long term, but you want to compare the risk or the rate of that outcome, whether it be anxiety or whatever, you're going to want to compare that and that group of people compared to somebody else. If they already have the condition, then you can't do it. They have to be healthy and free of that condition and susceptible. So what does susceptible mean? Well, if you're studying something like an infectious disease and the vaccine we have reason to believe works, then you can't include vaccinated people for that disease in your study because they're not going to be susceptible to getting the disease or their susceptibility is going to be a lot, a lot, a lot less than what it would be for somebody who's not vaccinated. So they have to be healthy and susceptible to the disease. Could they be vaccinated for something else? Absolutely. But they have to be susceptible to the disease you're wanting to study. So again, it's good to kind of take a lot of other information in advance. The same issues with confounding exist. So we know that odds ratios can be plagued with confounding. The same is true for risk ratios and rate ratios. Um, smoking status, Although a person may not currently have like coronavirus, um, their risk of getting it is supposedly higher if they've had some sort of lung damage. So confounding by like their air quality or confounding by other health conditions like previous conditions like COPD or confounding by age, you, you, wanna, you wanna take those factors into consideration so that you can adjust for them. The study also must be feasible. So, you know, you have to kind of think about like, how are you going to study something? Cohort studies are not going to be a good design for rare diseases, just like cross-sectional studies. Terrible design to try to study a rare disease. If you were wanting to study something like pancreatic cancer that might affect like one out of every, I don't know, 100,000 or 250,000 people, it's a fairly rare disease. It may affect more people than one out of 100,000, I don't know, but even say it affects one out of 25,000. The rule of tens says that for every factor we want to compare, 
we should have at least 10 cases. So if it affected, say, 1 in 25,000 people, which I think that's on the low end, or I mean, that, that's on the, yeah, the, the end that says that it's more common than what I think it really is. If it affected 1 in 25,000 people, you would need to enroll 10 times the number of 1. So 1 in 25,000, so 10 times that, we'd need to enroll 250,000 people just to get 10 cases, assuming they all participate. And then when are you going to enroll them? Like age 50? And then you're going to what? Wait? Like you're going to follow up with them like every year for like the next 10 years waiting for them to get pancreatic cancer? They can't already have pancreatic cancer. You don't know who is going to get pancreatic cancer. So why on earth would you do something so foolish as to say we're going to follow 25,000 people and do like annual or five-year checkups on them to see whether or not they have pancreatic cancer. It's much more efficient with rare diseases since we know the odds and the risk are approximately the same on a rare disease to go ahead and do a case control study. Find your 30 pancreatic cancer ca cases and then match those 30 pancreatic cancer cases up with maybe three, con three controls per case, you know, and of 120 people versus like 30 people and do the odds ratios on the risk factors that you're interested in. So studies have to be feasible. You have to be able to follow up with people. Some problems that may exist when you enroll people into a cohort study, sometimes the people that are going to participate, your volunteers that agree to it, they may not represent the general population. Some people aren't going to be a fan of saying, hey, I'm going to get to follow up with you every year for the next 10 years. That's not for everybody. Now, if the incentives are right and you say, well, you're going to get free medical care and $1,000 for these two hour visits. Well, then you might get more people who are lower income or you might get a nice mixture. So we worry about the same problems that we have in other study designs. But these people or volunteers are going to have to stick with it for the long haul. There's also the healthy worker effect that may exist. So um, when you enroll people in these studies, if they're working, you need to take into account that they're going to probably be different than if, like, if somebody stops working. So lost the follow-up. So in our example here, we had a few of them that disappeared. Sometimes we have reason to believe that the disappearance is just coincidental. But if you're doing a study of people, like you're going to follow up with a telephone call once every year. It's possible just because people have a harder time paying their phone bills when they're lower income or something. And they lose their phone line and then they have to get a new phone or they're buying these uh, temporary phones and you call them back and then it's disconnected, no longer available, or the wrong number. Somebody else is using the phone now. So if you're lost, the follow-up affects one group of people more than the other, then it's deferential. It could be that the sick people, what happens if people who actually come down with the disease suddenly are less likely for, for you to be able to get a hold of? Or it's a disease that kills them pretty quickly, so nobody wants to answer the phone and talk to you or nobody's there because the person got sick and died. So if that happens, that's a differential bias. And we know that differential biases are worse than non-differential biases. Differential is worse. Non-differential, still not fun, not good, but this one is worse. So we have the common confounding variables like age, gender, income, race and ethnicity, all those types of things. We can have also the same problems with misclassification. The misclassification problems, I'm going to go over a little example here really quick. One of the misclassifications that might exist may be cleared up right here in this little example. So I've got this example auto plant work and it assumes that auto plant work is linked to maybe heart disease. So they compare fast food workers. Walmart workers and auto plant workers who are 60 years of age and they follow them for five years and they do a phone call every year. 
After doing this, and they call the Walmart workers, the food workers, and the auto plant workers, they call them all one time a year. Now, in order to be in this study, they had to start off not having heart disease as a diagnosis. And when they talk to the auto plant workers, they find out that the auto plant workers end up reporting having been clinically diagnosed with heart disease far more frequently than the Walmart and fast food workers. So why might they be more likely to have been clinically diagnosed with heart disease? So it could be that their jobs are more stressful, there's something going on in the workplace, but you also have to think about potential confounding variables. And one could be that if you're doing an annual telephone follow-up versus an actual visit with a medical practitioner and you're asking them to tell you whether they've been clinically diagnosed by a nurse or a doctor with heart disease, it's possible that auto plant workers may report more disease being clinically diagnosed because they have more access to healthcare because many of the auto plant workers have health insurance through either their employer or their labor union and Walmart workers and fast food workers may not have the same kind of access to be clinically diagnosed. So that's just something to think about. That's just one of many potential confounding variables. Generally, if you're ever gonna to have to design a study, whether it be responding to the COVID-19 situation or whether it be dealing with trying to study heart disease or cancer, you often wanna make a list of all the potential confounding variables for that disease or diseases that may be like it and then see, you know, should you ask about it or be prepared to obtain data? And then should you design your study to avoid pitfalls where confounding may make your study harder to do? So some strengths to the cohort studies, like why are these the better ones? Because you are able to control who's participating. You don't know who's going to get sick or not. You don't know who's going to, you know, end up dying or not. So you might get a better measurement of the true exposure and disease. So that's a good thing. So you didn't have an understanding of who was going to get sick in advance. So that bias is kind of taken away there. A weakness though. These are the most expensive study designs. They're time consuming. And you can study multiple exposures. So don't worry about that. Um, typically, they try to start them up based on one exposure, but you can actually look at multiple things. And retrospective cohort say designs, they're a little cheaper than prospective designs. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So we'll skip that. The next set of videos we're going to get into are the epidemiology ones related to field epidemiology and outbreak epidemiology. I'm going to stop this video here and um, maybe have you watch a video on the Ebola outbreak for some lessons on how an outbreak in the United States could be or currently is being portrayed. So we'll stop there.